Hello. Um, in May, as the slide on the screen tells you, uh, I gave the first of what turned out to be two uh, papers, uh, this one on the history and application of the contractor's basis, and then the following week, the history and application of the receipts and expenditure basis. Um, uh, I've been asked to record them, uh, if not for posterity, uh, at least for the IRRV. It, it is a cheek, I think, for a lawyer to sound off about a method of valuation, uh, and I hope that you'll forgive me for it. I have two excuses. First, I don't propose to do any valuing, but to look at the principles and mechanics of the method as they've been described by the courts and tribunals. And secondly, I've learned a great deal from the valuers I've worked with over the years, and it would be quite wrong for me to offer a session on the contractor's basis without acknowledging them all as being uh, the source of my uh, knowledge, and in particular, Paul Needham, from whom I've learned a huge amount. Now, the Statute of Elizabeth did not define how the value of land was to be measured. The Parochial Assessment Act of 1836 established a definition of net annual value for rating purposes, and not that dissimilar to the definition of rateable value in the 1988 Act. The critical elements of the measure was, as it is today, a rent at which the hereditament might reasonably be expected to let from year to the year on identified terms and conditions. So at least since 1836, rating valuers have faced the problem of identifying an annual value for a hereditament, no matter what the evidence available to do it. All methods of valuation, it seems to me, proceed by way of a journey from information that you do know to a judgment about something that you don't know. In, rating, uh, in ratings case, it is the annual value that is the destination. When your starting point is uh, rental evidence, then the journey to rental value of the subject hereditament is generally be up by means of comparative judgment rather than by rationale or hypothesis. An assessment of other rents leads to the view that a return frontage adds X percent, uh, or that the different date of the rent against the AVD means that the uh, uh, value should be up or down Y percent, and so on. Where, though, there is no rental evidence, comparative judgment doesn't get you home on its own. And so rating experts in the courts have been forced, in the words of Viscount Cave in Metropolitan Water Board and Kingston Union, it's on the screen, been forced to have recourse to hypotheses of a more or less violent character. The contractor's basis is one of the two main hypotheses to which valuers in the courts have recourse. And it's important to acknowledge from the outset that because these hypotheses are necessarily violent, there are going to be imperfections in them. The problem from which the contractor's basis, as we know it, developed, is to find an annual value when the only information you had or could come by about the hereditament was of a capital nature. The capital information comes in two types, what it had cost the owner to acquire the hereditament or what it had cost the owner to build it. Before looking at the similarities and differences of those two sources of information, it's worth pausing to identify the sort of hereditaments in respect of which these problems most frequently uh, arose in, in the 19th century. Generally, we're talking about infrastructure, such as canals and reservoirs, pipes and so forth, uh, by which water was delivered to towns and cities in Victorian England. And we're talking about hereditaments provided to perform a social service, typically schools and sewage hereditaments. It's a glamorous world, the world of the contractor's basis. Perhaps, Perhaps the cleanest facts to illustrate the use by courts and valuers of capital information in rating valuation in the years after 1836 can be found in two cases uh, involving the provision of water to Liverpool. Liverpool and Chorley Union, 
and Liverpool and Llanfillen Union. In Chorley Union, the corporation had acquired the freehold interest in land from which the rainwater runoff drained into the corporation's reservoir. They had acquired the land in order to protect against pollution. Having decided that the corporation was in rateable occupation of the land, the Court of Appeal addressed the question whether the price paid by the corporation for the gathering ground is any evidence of rateable value. The slide shows the simple explanation that those simple facts allowed. And to my mind, it indicates the fixed point around which all the variables in the contractor's basis revolve. If on the valuation date, the occupier bought the hereditament freehold for X pounds, then he's decided that the purchase is worth the opportunity cost, namely the interest foregone. Clanfillin Union makes a similar point, but in this example, the emphasis was on the cost of construction. Liverpool had acquired land compulsorily with the aim of damming and flooding a valley to create a reservoir. The area to be flooded included the parish church of Llanwydd and the villages vicarage and schools. The act required Liverpool to construct a replacement church, replacement vicarage and schools. That's what they did. But they argued that in assessing the cost of construction of the reservoir for rating purposes, the cost of constructing those replacement buildings should be ignored because it had not been incurred on, in constructing the asset itself, the asset that was being valued. They lost because the cost of constructing the replacement buildings was a cost they had accepted in order to provide themselves with the rateable asset. It was part of the consideration they were prepared to pay in order to provide themselves with the reservoir. The next case I want to turn to is the Queen and the London School Board in 1886, so actually before both of the Liverpool cases I've just mentioned. It's worth setting the facts of this case beside the well-known statement of principle uh, made in it by Mr Justice Cave. Uh, as far as I can tell, the facts were these. Uh, the reports aren't that full. Pursuant to an act of 1870, the board had acquired land for a school. The assessment under appeal had been arrived at by looking at the land and the buildings separately. The annual value of the land was taken at 4% of its original price and the annual value of the buildings at 5% of the then estimated cost of constructing them. In other words, the land element was taken at a percentage applied to a historic land value, and the buildings element was taken at a percentage of the modern cost of constructing those buildings. Like London County Council and Erith, this case is better known for establishing the proposition that the actual occupier of a school or other municipal undertaking was a potential hypothetical tenant, even though it might be impossible in fact or forbidden by law for the actual occupier to take a yearly tenancy. But again, like Erith, the subsequent valuation started from capital inputs. Once it was established, as a matter of law that the actual occupier was a potential hypothetical tenant, it was usually also established as a matter of fact that that actual occupier was the most likely hypothetical tenant and that the question of value resolved to a question of what that occupier would be prepared to pay annually for the benefit of the occupation. This slide shows what Mr Justice Cave said in London School Board in the Divisional Court there are several points to emphasize. First, the test of interest on cost, as he calls it, is only a rough test. Secondly, although there are occasions on which it won't apply, it can apply where the place is occupied uh, by the owner. Thirdly, in those circumstances, interest on cost is some evidence to show what the value of occupation is to him. And fourthly, the rationale is expressed to be that if he could get a place cheaper at a less rent, 
than the interest on cost comes to, he wouldn't go to the expense of building, but would take the cheaper course and pay the rent. So it was a rough and ready test. The judge could have said no more than, it is a rough and ready test, which gives an indication of what, in effect, the actual occupier is paying for the annual occupation. But he went on to add a gloss, which actually, in my mind, uh, plays fast and loose with the tenses of the English language. Uh, the final sentence on the slide is all in the present conditional. If he could get a place cheaper at a lesser rent than the interest comes to, he wouldn't go to the expense of building. He'd rent that alternative instead. In reality, on the facts as I've just explained them, no such alternative was available. The costs of land acquisition and building construction had been incurred and there were no alternative premises to rent. Because in due course our journey is going to take us to Leamington Spa, there's one other comment to make uh, about this dictum of Mr Justice Cave. As appears from the evidence in the case, the costs that he is talking about were the costs representing the actual hereditament itself, the historic cost of acquiring the land and the current cost of building the buildings on it. These are not the costs of providing oneself with an alternative by construction. The alternative that's being posited is not of building elsewhere, but of renting elsewhere. In my view, the judge wasn't saying that there ever was a genuine choice. He was simply saying that by positing the choice, as it were as a yardstick, he hopes to give a degree of enlightenment as to why interest on cost is a rough and ready test of that annual value. His is a rough and ready rationale. By analogy, if you like, it's a hypothesis of quite a violent character. Not only was the rationale rough and ready, also the mechanics of the 19th century valuations were pretty rough and ready. We've already seen in London School Board that the capital figures were picked up where they might be found. Historic price paid for the land and current construction cost. No attempt apparently had been made either to update the value of the land or to, to depreciate the cost of construction for the age of the buildings. And then the percentages applied to them were described by Lord Herschel in Erith as a rule of thumb. Indeed, in uh, Metropolitan Water Board and Chertsey in 1915, valuers were still using the 4% on land and 5% on buildings that we saw in the London School Board case 30 years earlier. Over time, rate payers and those charged with setting rateable values have attempted to refine the way in which the raw available capital information is manipulated and to refine the means by which it's converted from capital to annual currency. That process of refinement is really what the whole of the subsequent history of the contractor's basis is about, with the exception uh, of the prescription of the decap rate, which uh, appears to me to be an attempt to draw one particular process of refinement to a halt. Uh, these attempts at refinement, some of which generated more evidential heat than valuation light, inevitably raised issues about the hypothesis on which the valuation rests, because no refinement of method can survive unless it is consistent with the hypothesis for which it's applied. Perhaps the most important of these refinement is one that had a part to play in the first change of name of the method as interest on cost was supplanted by interest on structural value. Uh, that emphasis uh, on value as distinct from cost is what Lord Herschel was on about in the second part of the quotation that's on the slide. An owner may well not be prepared to uh, pay 5% on the cost of constructing buildings if the capital price of ownership of the actual buildings 
is less than the present cost of constructing them. In fairness, this is a point which had already been noticed in the early days. In the Queen and, Queen and Mile End Road in 1847, the judge had noted that the outlay of capital may furnish no criterion of the rent since it may have been injudiciously expended and what was costly may have become worthless by subsequent change. But it does appear that in the years after Mile End Road, the distinction was either not raised on the facts or not drawn out by the parties. So for example, I've not found in the 19th century any allowances for the age of buildings. In Metropolitan Water Board in Chertsey, Lord Lorriban, having reminded himself that interest on cost was a rule of thumb, used as evidence in answering the statutory question, went on to say, when cost is taken as a basis, it must surely be on the footing that what has in fact been paid presumably indicates capital value, and that interest on it presumably indicates annual value. Echoing him, Lord Atkinson identified the capital element of the exercise as the cost of acquiring ownership of the hereditament. That's its market value. Those are the two quotations on the slide. One of the early examples of attempts by the ratepayer to argue that the cost of constructing the hereditament was greater than its capital value with Hall and Sizedon Union in 1912, which involved the sewage farm. The ratepayer argued before court of sessions that the treatment of the sewage could be affected by a cheaper method, the bacterial method, than the one actually employed, which was called broad irrigation. And that this uh, fact should be taken into account by adopting lower costs to which the rate percent was to be applied. The argument failed on the facts, but the appeal court accepted that a means, uh, hypothetically to achieve the same function as the hereditament itself performed, that was a legitimate consideration. It could only be a legitimate consideration because it potentially gave an insight into the difference between cost and value. An important observation from the 19th century cases and those in the first half of the 20th century is that they appear all to be seeking to identify the capital value of the subject hereditament itself. And when they're considering construction costs, the costs are constructing the subject hereditament. On the relatively rare occasions on which an alternative is positive, as for example by Mr. Justice Cave, it's, it is to explain the justification for using interest on structural value as a measure of rateable value. Certainly as far as I can see, none of the decisions turns on the practicability of constructing or renting any alternative. I return briefly to decapitalization. Uh, I've already noted that historically the interest rates used were standard or rules of thumb. But there are two further points to emphasize as emerging from the 19th and 20th century cases. The first is that in England, decapitalization was looked at from the perspective of the occupier uh, tenant. What is the annual cost of ownership? it was not generally looked at from the viewpoint of the landlord. In contrast, in Scotland, it became the practice until the pres prescription of decat rates to look at yields as perceived in the industrial market of premises that were let. In other words, to look at the return which the landlord might expect. The second point to emphasize about the 19th and 20th century cases is, the courts, is that the courts rejected the arguments put by ratepayers who were able to borrow at preferential rates that decapitalization should be at those preferential rates. The first reason for rejecting these arguments was pragmatic. You risked breaching the principle of uniformity 
if the occupier with a better credit rating could achieve a lower rotable value. The other reason attempted to deal with the economics of the argument and not just the unpalatable nature of its consequences. As Lord Parker pointed out in Chertsey, the tenant is out of pocket by reason of its occupation to the extent of the interest which it might have obtained on the capital sum. And its ability to borrow at preferential rates is nothing to the question of the rates of interest it could obtain by lending its own capital. So, uh, by the time of the Port of London Authority and Orsett Union in 1920, Lord Dunedin was able to describe decapitalization as being by means of ordinary rates of interest. In 1963, the then editors of Ride, the 11th edition, noted a change in the application of what had by then become known as the contractor's theory or the contractor's test. Their observation is split between this slide and the one that follows it. And it's worth reading them. As it was originally used, in the days before the First World War, when cost and value were closely related. This method of valuation involved looking more, involved little more than the application of appropriate percentages to the cost of construction of the buildings and to the cost of acquiring the land of which the hereditament consisted. However, the vast rise in building costs during and after the Second World War created a wide gap between cost and value, which made modification of the method essential if it was to produce credible net annual values. Accordingly, after the cost of construction had been ascertained, it became the practice for valuers to reduce the figure to one which represented the effective capital value of the hereditament. That is to say, the market value of the hereditament in a form effective for its purpose. Uh, on the basis of what those editors had to say at that time, uh, I draw a somewhat arbitrary division and describe the period after the Second World War as being the one that introduces the modern history of the contractor's basis. And in my view, there are three main themes to that modern history. The first is the categorization of the method into stages. The second is the comments of the Solicitor General in Lamington Spa, and the playing out of differing interpretations of them. And the third is the approach to decapitalization. The same 11th edition of Ride uh, explained, in the modern practice of applying the contractor's basis, it's possible to discern five stages. The fourth and fifth of which are not usually recognized as distinct, though they should be. The first stage is the estimation of the cost of constructing the buildings. The second is to make deductions from the cost of construction to allow for age, obsolescence, and any other factors necessary to arrive at the effective capital value. If, they said, there is sufficient evidence of relevant capital transactions, there seems to be no reason in principle why the valuation should not begin at this stage, that is with the capital transactions. The third stage is to estimate the cost of the land. The fourth is to apply the market rate or rates at which money can be borrowed or invested to the effective capital value of the buildings and the land. The result is what it would cost the occupier in annual terms to provide the hereditament for himself rather than to lease it. And the fifth stage is to consider whether the result of the fourth really represents what the hypothetical tenant would pay for an annual tenancy on the statutory terms and to make any adjustment necessary to ensure that no higher rent is fixed as the basis of assessment than that which it is believed the owner would really be willing to pay for the occupation of the premises. That's the stand back and look stage. There's a lot that could be said about the five stages. I limit myself to a couple of observations. 
the first is that these stages emerged as a means of assisting valuers to get their thoughts in order. They were discerned by the editors of, of Ride. Nobody was insisting on them as a rigid orthodoxy, other than which any alternative approach would necessarily be heretical. Indeed, in Eton College and Lane, the tribunal noted that valuers were at liberty to choose to adopt variants of the method, provided they are aware of what they are doing, know just how they're using their particular variant of the method, and provided they constantly keep in mind what they're comparing with what. In other words, the stages are a guide to assist valuers so that all matters that can affect value are taken into account coherently. They are not a straitjacket, they are not an excuse for leaving out of account a factor which affects value. And that's a point that was confirmed as recently as the SEM logistics decision. The other point I want to draw out at this stage is that even in 1963, and I emphasized it earlier, Ride felt the need to warn against the dangers of blurring stages four and five. Until the prescription of the decap rate, it was often convenient to reflect within the percentage factors which actually were not part of the ordinary rate of interest, and so analytically were part of stage five and not of stage four. This is a warning that it's worth bearing in mind when we get to the debates that the tribunal has had with itself about what the prescribed decap rate represents. And the cases where that debate has been held are first Eastbourne and Allen, uh, then Allen and the English Sports Council, and most recently Hughes and Exeter. Leamington Spa. The Leamington Spa case was decided in 1961, so a couple of years before that edition of Ride that I've just drawn your attention to and it involved the evaluation of five local authority schools. One was newly built, the other four were old, built between 1840, 1884 and 1887. The famous uh, quotation, which I pray see on the slide, is that in his opening, the Solicitor General pointed to the logic of the contractor's basis method, in words we cannot hope to improve upon. As I understand it, the argument is that the hypothetical tenant has an alternative to leasing the hereditament and paying rent for it. He can build a precisely similar building for himself. He could borrow the money on which he would have to pay interest, or he could use his own capital on which he would have to forego interest to put up a similar building for his owner occupation rather than rent it. And he'll do that rather than pay what he would regard as an excessive rent. That is a rent which is greater than the interest he foregoes by using his own capital to build the building himself. The argument is that he will therefore be unwilling to pay as annual rent for a hereditament more than it would cost him in the way of annual rent, annual interest on the capital sum necessary to build a similar hereditament. On the other hand, if the annual rent demanded is fixed marginally below what it would cost him in the way of annual interest, on the capital sum necessary to build a similar hereditament, it will be in his interest to rent the hereditament rather than build it. With the caveat sounded by Lord Denning in Cardiff Corporation and Williams that the rent should be fixed significantly and not marginally below the annual interest, uh, that came to be described as the classic exposition of the contractor's basis. It's not a million miles away from Mr. Justice Cave in London School Board. But by some, it's been taken much more literally than the London School Board dictum ever was. Uh, and that has led to fundamentally competing interpretations of what the contractor's basis valuer is seeking to identify at the capital stages of the valuation. Although the high point of what I would call the new approach was the valuation officer's unsuccessful argument in Monsanto and Farris, uh, 
even now there appears not to be complete agreement. For some time after it was reported, the Solicitor General's statement brought no great dispute in its wake. The common view remained that the aim of the capital stages of the valuation was the market capital value of the hereditament. In Leamington Spa itself, the record of the Solicitor General's submission is immediately followed by, forgive me, these words, every valuation must hang, as it were, on a peg of factual evidence. The peg which supports the contractor's basis is the cost of construction, which if not known can be estimated without difficulty. But cost is not necessarily market value and the next step in the exercise is to estimate by how much the cost should be discounted to allow for uneconomic planning, uh, architectural embellishments and extravagances, surplus accommodation and those other factors which explain the difference between cost and value. Then the site has to be valued and the decision taken upon the rate of interest to be applied to the effective capital value. Now, what you have on the screen there is the second half of, of uh, Leamington's Bar that I quoted to you earlier. There were several instances in which the decision itself in Leamington's Bar did not follow literally the Solicitor General's text, uh, but more uh, that analysis that comes immediately after it, uh, which I quoted to you, but which isn't on the slide. But cost is not necessarily market value. And the next step is to estimate uh, by how much the cost should be discounted to get to capital value. So even the Solicitor General's own witness, the valuation officer, did not contemplate the construction of a precisely similar building, which is the Solicitor General's phase, uh, but for the old schools, he constituted substitute modern buildings. In line with the approach of the text on this slide, forgive me, I've got a slide behind. In line um, with the approach of the text on this slide, age and obsolescence allowances were made to move from cost of the substituted building to market value of the actual schools and not the tenants alternative. The exercise in the tribunal's mind was to formulate a standard by which it could judge the capital value of the actual buildings. To do that, it asked what would be the cost of building the actual buildings, in the case of the new schools, or substituted buildings in the case of the old schools, and then compared the attributes of the actual with those costed buildings in, and did that comparison in value terms. The new school needed no further adjustment, but the old ones did. To my mind, the tribunal was trying to identify what Lord Atkinson had said they should seek to identify all the way back in Chertsey, namely the cost of acquiring the ownership of the hereditament. And that appears to have been the view taken at the time and in cases that followed. I've already shown you the edition of Ride published two years later in 1963, uh, which talks of effective capital value uh, as being the market value of the hereditament in a form effective for its purpose. In the same year, in Gilmore and Baker Carr and others, number two for the enthusiast, the tribunal itself agreed that the modern practice was described in the passage from Ride uh, that I've been showing you. And then the tribunal in Baker Carr characterized stage two as being to arrive at effective capital value. We accept the definition of counsel for the appellant, the valuation officer, namely the market value of the hereditament in a form effective for its purpose. The test is a market test. <laughs> 
there are passages to similar effect in Coppin and East Midlands Airport, Gudgeon and Croydon Borough Council, Cardiff City Council and Williams, and Leicester City Council and Nuffield Nursing Homes. There has been some suggestion that a comment in Imperial College uh, indicated that the aim was not capital value, but that interpretation uh, of Imperial College has been rejected by the tribunal, both in Monsanto and specifically in SEM Logistics. So I don't feel the need to go around that particular loop. So I come to Monsanto, which was, as I say, the moment in which the proponents of what I would call a new interpretation of the contractor's basis uh, went into battle and lost. The valuation officer's argument in Monsanto started from a literal interpretation of the Solicitor General and reached the unsurprising conclusion that the tenant's alternative was unrealistic. There was a list of questions that could not be answered sensibly uh, if you took the literal interpretation of the Solicitor General. And those questions included, where was the alternative located? Does the creation of the alternative affect demand for the actual hereditament? What is the tenant supposed to be doing in the period for which the alternative is being constructed? Between the parties in Monsanto, the fallacy of taking the Solicitor General literally was common ground. More controversially, the valuation officer proceeded from that rejection of a literal interpretation to a radically different idea of what the valuer was seeking to achieve in the capital stages of the valuation. The aim, said the valuation officer, was not the capital value of the subject hereditary. It was to derive a suitable sum to reflect any deficiencies in the actual hereditament in its actual state in comparison with the new equivalent costed at stage one, viewed from the perspective of a potential tenant. Although the VO was clear that that suitable sum was not intended to represent capital value, and indeed it couldn't if it was being perceived from the perspective of a tenant, he was less clear about what it was intended to represent. The tribunal saw the difficulty of taking the Solicitor General literally, but thought that the valuation officer was throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And three quotations give a general gist of um, Tom Hoyes's decision. First, a notion much closer to the established five-stage method and the mechanics of its operation as practiced by valuers would be that the capital sums of stages one to three were being incurred by the hypothetical tenant of stages four and five. In effect, the hypothetical tenant is to be regarded as a prospective purchaser of the actual hereditament for parts of the valuation process, for the capital parts. Uh, secondly, in the rating context, said Tom Hoyes, the uh, hypothetical landlord seeks a return, a rent, commensurate with the market value of his asset, the hereditament, and the hypothetical tenant is to be taken as willing to pay a rent which represents, which reflects the annual value of occupying the hereditament measured by that market value. And thirdly, counsel for the valuation officer rightly accepted that stage two was part of the process of turning cost into value. I would add, it is the principal stage and that the value he spoke to can only be effective capital value. To designate it as adjusted replacement cost is to confuse and easily lead to the calculation of a hybrid sum, which is neither new cost nor a capital value of economic or, or practical consequence. The tribunal has followed the Monsanto approach uh, subsequently in, for instance, Eastbourne and Allen and SEM Logistics. It's also been endorsed in Northern Ireland in Belfast International Airport 
And it seems to me the Monsanto approach is in direct line from those cases we were looking at earlier uh, about the importance of identifying at the capital stage, capital market value. We left the decapitalization rate in Chertsey with the rejection by the House of Lords of the argument that the rate applied should reflect the actual tenant's ability to borrow at preferential rates. We passed the 11th edition of Ride and it's warning to keep stages four and five separate. The next stop is the Cardiff College of Education in 1973 for the Court of Appeals decision in Cardiff and Williams. This is the case in which Lord Denning qualified the Solicitor General's classic explanation by saying that the annual rent must be set not marginally but much below the annual interest charge because by paying the interest on capital the owner gets title and appreciation in capital value whereas the tenant does not obtain those benefits. That proposition has solidified into a concept known as the Denning discount. It was though not the subject matter of the debate uh, in the Court of Appeal. The parties had agreed that had the hereditament been a commercial building, the hypothetical tenant would have been willing to pay 6%. They also agreed that the tenant of an educational building would not pay as much. The Lands Tribunal had adopted 4.5% and the ratepayers said it should have been three and a half percent. In essence, the debate was a stage five issue. To what extent did the evidence indicate that the rateable value would be lower than the product of applying a market interest rate to effective capital value? Imperial College, which was heard by the Lands Tribunal over four weeks in 1984, was the high point of complication in the assessment of the decap rate. The ratepayer and valuation officer both reached three and a half percent, but by markedly different routes, and the rating authority had six percent. The different approaches looked at over that four-week period included the minimum lending rate over 20 years, the inflation rate over the same period, the weighted average minimum lending rate in the three years up to the 1st of April 1973, the minimum lending rate in October 1972, the bor matters about borrowers' premia, the Denning discount features and how much should be related to them, uh, and the special circumstances of educational hereditament. Government chose to intervene when the 1990 list came around. Since that time, two DCAT rates have been prescribed for each new list, a general rate and a lower rate for defence, education and healthcare establishments. The main debate that has survived that description of the DCAT rate concerns the features that the prescribed general decap rate comprehends. In the first place one might want to look for that, it, 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 help on that, it is um, from government uh, and an explanation of how the decap rate has been identified in any particular year, but it's not possible to discern from government consultation papers how the general rate is reached. Reference is made to a number of possible considerations not all of them compatible with each other, uh, including a desire to manipulate the result to ensure that uh, this, this new list's contractors basis cases aren't going to come out to a wildly different answer from the last lists. After all of those factors have been identified, then without further explanation, a rate emerges fully formed uh, like, like Athena from Zeus's head. Uh, nonetheless, in Eastbourne, the tribunal stated that the purpose of prescription was to remove from contention the economic considerations which had taken up so much time in the Imperial College case. 
and to promote uniformity as between different assessments in that respect. Those economic considerations uh, referred solely to matters affecting the rate at which money could be borrowed to finance the construction of the tenants' national alternative building or works, so they said in uh, Eastbourne. Other matters, including those taken into account in stages one to three or five, were, said the tribunal, uh, unaffected by the prescription of a decapitalization rate. In the English Sports Council case, the tribunal was persuaded that Cardiff and Williams meant that matters bearing on the tenant's ability to pay are subsumed in the prescribed general decap rate and so could not be considered at stage five. In Hughes and Exeter, the tribunal has re recently uh, rejected that approach and returned to the orthodoxy of the Eastbourne analysis. In passing, I might comment that whilst I think the Hughes and Exeter result is justified insofar as the general decat rate is concerned, the position is rather more difficult with the specific lower rate for education heritagements uh, uh, and um, the others in that category for which the lower rate applies. Uh, it seems to me that that lower rate must incorporate something like the factors which in Cardiff and Williams itself led the parties to agree that the hypothetical tenant of the college would pay less than the market rent. And then uh, I come towards the end by describing, looking at uh, so a selection of recent issues. Uh, and I want to like briefly on some of the issues that have emerged in recent contractors basis cases and which I haven't yet looked at. And I've selected the following, the modern equivalent under utilization, stage four as a ceiling value and stage five adjustments. The ratepayers argument in Hall and Sizedon could perhaps be recast nowadays as a modern equivalent argument. The value of the hereditament was in the facility it allowed the occupier to treat sewage. The treatment of the sewage could be affected by a cheaper method, the bacterial method, than the one actually employed, broad irrigation. The capital value of the hereditament won't exceed the age depreciated cost of a modern equivalent sewage treatment facility which provides the same functionality of the actual, but would cost less to construct. The modern equivalent, therefore, is a yardstick against which to measure a deficiency of the actual hereditament, be it technical obsolescence, as alleged in sized and union, or layout overcapacity or all of the above. What is critical is that the modern equivalent design that the valuer uses is reliable for that purpose. That was not the case in Shell UK and the assessor for the Grampian Joint Board, in which the Lands Tribunal for Scotland valued a gas terminal that had been purpose built. The rate pair presented the tribunal with a complex study indicating a hypothetical minimum cost gas plant. There were several problems with it. The substitute was designed to minimum standards and with rates mitigation in mind. Shell was unable to identify to the tribunal's satisfaction the deficiencies in the actual plant that the substitute addressed. The tribunal concluded that what Shell could and would build with rates saving predominantly or prominently, albeit not predominantly in mind, does not necessarily reflect what Shell could and would build if free of that constraint. It does not necessarily represent what any hypothetical tenant would build. In short, the study didn't offer a reliable yardstick by which to, to measure the deficiencies of the actual. In the Belfast International Airport case, on the other hand, there were identified deficiencies in the terminal. The rate payer instructed an architect to design a substitute terminal that had the same functionality as the actual, but in accordance with contemporary design norms. 
The design responded to inter alia the deficiencies that flowed from the piecemeal construction of the actual airport and from the security requirements that had applied during the troubles but no longer applied. It was designed from scratch, but was a safe yardstick by which to assess the deficiencies of the actual. One of the features for which a modern equivalent can be used is to assess uh, over capacity allowance. I'm moving on to underutilization. That was indeed one of its functions in the Belfast International Airport case. The terminal was capable of accommodating a greater passenger throughput than the hypothetical operator would ever expect to achieve. The value of the terminal building was therefore no greater than the depreciated cost of a smaller terminal designed to fit out to fit onto the site and to accommodate all the capacity that the, that the hypothetical operator would consider to be of value. But it isn't always wise to assess overcapacity or underutilization by way of a modern equivalent. I offer two main reasons for this. The first is litigation risk. If you are assessing all of your main stage two allowances for technical and functional obsolescence by means of a modern equivalent, severe damage can be caused to your case on overcapacity if the tribunal decides that your modern equivalent is unreliable for reasons that do not go to overcapacity. See, for example, by analogy, what happened to Shell. And the other reason is that capacity and utilization can have a graduated effect on value. Sam Logistics is an example here. It, it was an oil refinery that had been repurposed as a tank farm. There was a core capacity of tanks that was in use all of the time. There was no problem ascribing full value to those tanks. There were also some tanks that would never be used. There was no problem in ascribing nil value to them. In the middle was a range of tanks that would be occasionally used if the market eventually improved as compared to the rather parlous state it found itself in the AVD. Those tanks had some value to the hypothetical purchaser uh, of, at the capital stages, but not as much as the tanks he would use most of the time. So this is an element which relates to capacity and utilization, which affects the value of the hereditary, but isn't measured by a modern equivalent. In, in SAM, we pushed the un, underutilization envelope a little further, at this time unsuccessfully. The only way to import or export petrochemicals to and from the site was over its jetty, but for large parts of the time, no vessel was moored. Over time, only 40% usage occurred. The tribunal, probably rightly, were not interested in making any underutilization allowance to the cost of the jetty. They said that the fact that the front and only door to a hereditary is only in fact used for X percent of the time does not alter the fact that it provides value and indeed is indispensable 100% of the time. And then I turn to stage four as a ceiling value. Uh, one of the valuation officer's allegations in Monsanto was that contrary to what had been common ground in earlier cases, stage four didn't provide a ceiling. The tribunal didn't accept that and has maintained the position that it does provide a ceiling more recently in Hughes and Exeter. The proposition is generally expected expressed by reference to Leamington Spa, the hypothetical tenant would not pay more than the annual cost uh, on the capital sum employed in providing the tenant's alternative. I'm not sure myself that the Solicitor General is needed for that purpose. If stage three has reached the capital value of the hereditament itself at the valuation date, then the actual occupier uh, as owner is foregoing the annual income adjusted for the Denning discounts on, the va on that value in order to occupy. That is the cost to him of occupation and there is no evidence of anybody being willing to pay more than the actual occupier by way of rent. Uh, 
the rent might be higher if the capital value were higher than that derived at stage three. But the issue there is not whether stage four provides a ceiling, but whether on the facts stage three it is, uh, value is correct. One might consider that the stage three value is a correct estimate of the capital value, but that the decap rate underestimates the annual income foregone. That, in my view, the Secretary of State has in effect told the tribunal not to accept such a suggestion. Uh, and finally, stage five adjustments. Uh, I want to say a couple of things briefly on this subject. The orthodox description of the method has capital matters dealt with in the first three stages and stage five is the moment when the perspective of a tenant comes into play. Quite often though, the evidence does not fit with that neat divide. Uh, Belfast Airport gives an example. The disadvantages of the actual layout uh, as compared with the modern equivalent meant that the operator incurred excess security costs. In reality, that excess would have affected the capital as well as the annual value. But the evidence produced showed the annual sum. There was in practice no benefit in capitalizing that sum to make an allowance at stage two. It was much easier to recognize that the stage three figure did not represent capital market value to the extent that it omitted to reflect these excess costs and to reflect the feature when it was most convenient to do so at stage five. The tribunal found that to be a legitimate approach. The other point on stage five concerns the measurement of allowances. In, in SAM, there were annual excess operating costs of the tribunal found 430,000 pounds, comparing the actual with the modern equivalent. The rate pair didn't argue for an allowance of every penny of that, we said that the parties would higgle it to £250,000. The tribunal agreed that faced with this sort of evidence, the appropriate uh, approach was to make a stage five deduction of £250,000 and not to attempt to phrase the allowance uh, as a percentage of the stage four figure, even though conventionally allowances are made as a percentage. In conclusion, the contractor's basis method is a hypothesis of a quite violent character. It has to be violent in order to make the journey from quite often pretty rudimentary capital information to annual value. It's not possible to proceed from that information to an annual value of the subject hereditament by smooth steps of unimpeachable logic. So gaps have to be filled. Sometimes that filling is explained by hypotheses that do not satisfy intellectually and which assume as practicable things that are not practicable. To mix the metaphor, the shoe is bound to pinch in places. I know that others disagree, uh, but in my view, the critical feature to keep in mind is that the aim of the capital stages is, is to derive a figure that amounts as effectively as may be on the evidence to your best estimate of the hereditament's capital value. Thank you very much for listening.